definitely a local crop that you won't find uh, you know, anywhere else in the country or the world. The old saying is you can take a bad crop and make it better in the barn or you can take a good crop and ruin it. It's a dangerous thing. The least little thing can set them off, but we've, we've never lost a barn yet. The art and science of dark fired tobacco production in western Kentucky begins each spring with the seeding of greenhouses in early to mid-March. In a semi-hydroponic system, the transplants grow in styrofoam trays floating on a nutrient solution. The plastic trays we're using, there are uh, a lot of points about environmental sustainability with those that we don't have with a, a styrofoam tray. These have a lifespan of maybe 20 to 25, 30 years even, and it's something we can get totally clean. We can clean all the pythium out of these, basically, at least in theory, out of these plastic trays that we couldn't with our styrofoam trays. So this PVC system is under each of these beds. And this is, this is how we get equal distribution of fertilizer and TerraMaster fungicide uh, that we apply. As opposed to dumping it, uh, the fertilizer right down the corner of the bed, uh, we can put it in one place through a submersible pump out of a can here on the walkway and then pump it into the bed through this branching PVC system uh, to give us you know, pretty much equal distribution. Greenhouses take time and management. It is something that you can't just uh, partially do. You have to monitor them constantly. The greenhouse phase requires about eight weeks of growth before plants are ready to leave their first home. During this time, farmers schedule weekly fungicide sprays and frequent clipping to keep the young plants four to five inches tall. We like to spray Mancozeb fungicide at least once a week after we start clipping. If we clip twice a week, we may spray every other time we clip, but at least, at least once a week uh, from the start of clipping up until the plants leave the greenhouse. A short, hardened plant makes setting easier and limits transplant shock in the field. Dark tobacco is transplanted at about 5,000 plants per acre. This is less than the seven to 8,000 plants per acre typically used for burley tobacco. The average planting dimensions are 40 inch rows with plant spacing around 32 inches in the row. Although historically, farmers cultivated a crop one or two times. More recently, Kentucky dark tobacco growers are adopting strip tillage techniques to conserve topsoil on roughly 30% of acres planted. We're tilling a small section just where the plants go and leaving the rest undisturbed, uh, cut down on erosion and increase soil organic matter and planting right through that small strip makes for cleaner tobacco in the fall, conserves moisture, and makes for a nice crop. We strip till every acre of tobacco. I'm actually the first one to ever try strip till on tobacco. It's great for soil conservation, and we will sow a lot of ryegrass for cover crop in the fall, and then burn it down in the spring and plant tobacco into the ryegrass cover crop. In addition, no-till is also gaining acceptance on a small percentage of the acreage. Following transplanting, the next major step is topping and sucker control. Topping is a term used to describe removal of the terminal flower bud, thereby diverting the plant's energy away from producing seed and more towards the leaf. Workers remove the terminal bud and flower by hand on each plant when it is small and leave about 16 to 18 leaves on the plant after the bud is removed. Removing the terminal bud triggers the plant to produce and transfer nicotine from the root system to the upper portions of the plant. Then the plant responds further by sending out auxiliary shoots at leaf axles known as suckers. As soon as you break the top out of a tobacco plant, it just wanted to make a seed so it pushes out suckers from top to bottom, once you top it, you can't stop it. Auxiliary suckers must be controlled to maintain yield potential, leaf quality, and leaf chemical profiles that are desired by tobacco buyers. Sucker control chemicals are typically applied manually to each plant. Workers use backpack sprayers or hose extensions from boom sprayers. This practice of manual sucker control application is known as oiling. Dark tobacco plants take on a very different character after topping. Leaves begin to thicken, get darker, grow more prostrate on the plant, 
and become more oily. Once topping and sucker control are complete, dark tobacco typically remains in the field for approximately six weeks before it's harvested. When plants are mature and ready for harvest, leaves will snap when pinched between the fingers and will show a very faint yellow cast. Leaves will be very brittle and easily damaged at maturity. Skilled workers will then stalk harvest the plant at the ground level and gently lay the plant down to allow the tobacco to fall or field wilt for a period of one to four hours or more depending on sunlight and temperature conditions. This field wilting period is critical to prevent leaf loss when the crop is picked up for housing in the curing barn. However, dark tobacco left too long in the field to wilt is very susceptible to sunburn, which can render a crop useless if severe. After the crop has wilted, it is spiked onto sticks and loaded onto scaffold wagons for transport out of the field and to the barn for housing and curing. Once tobacco is on the scaffold wagon, it is much less susceptible to sunburn if parked in the shade or covered. The plants can be allowed to wilt further on the wagon before housing in the barn. Sticks are then placed in specialized tier barns, typically covered with metal and much more airtight than burly barns. After about five to eight days of yellowing in the barn, the first firing begins with hardwood slabs placed in rows in the floor of the barn and covered with coarse, moist sawdust. If you look at this sawdust here, it's pretty coarse. It comes from a circular sawmill. There's also band sawdust that we use as a whole lot finer, which it can be used, but it's gonna, it's gonna do a, you know, a few different things in a barn, uh, you know, unlike circular sawdust. It's gonna you know, tend to cake up more, it seems like, if you got the finer band sawdust. As those slabs burn, it's gonna make the sawdust fall onto the fire, and it's gonna keep it smoldering, kinda like a damper. And so the band sawdust, it'll, it tends to cake up and fall, and as it falls uh, there, it, it can make more sparks. And it can, sometimes you have a fire going, you know, burning the slabs, but the, uh, the sawdust, band sawdust, may not fall in. And so you may have flames down here, uh, and may even get up on top of the sawdust, which we don't like. And so the circular sawdust seems to work a whole lot better. Fires are lit on the ends of the rows so that the fire will smolder and burn slowly across each row of slabs and sawdust. This firing process is repeated two to four more times until the stalk, leaf midribs, and stems are dried and a uniform dark brown finish is achieved on the surface of each leaf. Each firing event typically lasts three to ten days depending on how the fires are prepared. The first fire and it's just totally green. That's the one that's the most important because you gotta, you gotta cure it down, you don't want it to, if you cure it too fast, it'll turn it green, you know, or, or it'll stay green. <clears throat> if you don't do it fast enough, uh, the tobacco will go to rot, uh, it'll, we call it strutting, but it'll, instead of wilting down, the, the leaves will just start spreading out again. And it gets all, it gets tight, seals it off, and it'll, uh, it's called house burn, but it, it just basically starts rotting it. With dark fire tobacco, benzopyrene is a big issue. It's also a carcinogen that's really specific to dark fired, where the more we fire the crop, uh, we increase benzopyrene levels, and so we're trying to minimize that in the way that we fire and not firing more than needed. Excessive firing, all the companies are kind of you know, trying to cut back on the amount of fire uh, that growers are using. In say a barn like this, you know, where we're firing now three times, we, uh, they might have fired this crop maybe you know, five or six times if you went back, you know, 10, 15 years ago. And the tobacco would come out a lot more dark brown, in some cases, almost black. Once fire curing is complete, tobacco is allowed to absorb moisture, known as ordering, to allow it to be handled when removed from the barn. Leaves are then removed from the stalk at roughly 22 to 25 percent moisture. Workers separate the leaves into grades, depending on where the leaves grew on the stalk. The lower leaves are called lugs. The seconds are mid-stalk leaves. And the third grade, called leaf, is stripped from the upper stalk. Leaves from each stalk position are typically flaked by producing a oriented, uniform layer of leaves three inches wide and about 20 inches across. 
These flakes of dark tobacco are then positioned neatly on hogshead lids, which are lids of the barrels that will be used by the buyer for storing and fermenting the crop. Dark tobacco is then delivered to the buyer, where it will be processed, loaded into barrels, and allowed to ferment for approximately three years before it is removed and manufactured into moist snuff.